Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in about 15 seconds. I'll give you guys time to take your virtual seats. Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a second. Welcome to today's masterclass. My name is Sandra Ellery and I will be your host today. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are a global nonprofit trade association with over 450 companies in 35 countries. To highlight just a few of CSIA member, many member benefits, the CSIA Best Practices Manual Guides control system integration companies to set up running of a solid company. Any system integrated company will benefit from the best practices, but earning the CSIA certification is a confirmation by a third party that you have deployed them correctly. For partner members, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow their system integrated program, understand their customer pain point, monitor industry trends, and share their thought leadership. A trusted resource of qualified integrator and suppliers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps system integrators, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For system integrators and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position your companies and C-suite as thought leaders, and nurtures prospects by providing a credible source for information about your company and its products. Finally, a reminder that in 2021, you will have increased access to knowledge sharing, community building and network throughout the year when you join or renew your CSIA membership. CSIA is committed to delivering extremely relevant content to system integrators while providing partner members access to a highly engaged audience. To that end, CSIA will deliver weekly virtual events on broad range of topics and experiences, all of which are open to sponsorship. For more information about CSIA member, virtual events, and sponsorship and advertising opportunity, contact us. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Jack Barber and Don Roberts. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for that, Sandra. Um, Don, you want to make sure you're off mute as well? Super. Um, well, quick little introduction to Exotech. I imagine most of the folks in the audience have probably uh, uh, seen or heard of us before, but we're a management consulting uh, firm that focuses exclusively on the system integration, I'll say in our industry, the automation industry. Uh, and the goal with this uh, web event today is uh, one of the things that Exotech does is assist our community with the implementation of best practices and kind of infamously known as, as an auditor uh, for those. Uh, and, you know, we realized that, that the vast majority of members of CSI joined with the intent of kind of getting their company to the next level. So uh, some of you may have joined uh, and are just, you know, kind of trying to get started on how to implement uh, CSI best practices. Others may have been members for a while and um, maybe worked on a few of the chapters of best practices, but, you know, really are in the wanting to get serious about implementation and working towards an audit. So uh, that's what we're doing with this series of sessions this year is just um, going through the best practices and, you know, highlighting areas that as auditors and, and uh, company that works with system integrators on these best practices, just things that we've seen and kind of consider it tips and whatnot for it. So 
back in Q1, we did a general orientation to the best practices themselves and kind of the process for implementing best practices. Um, so if you didn't uh, catch that the first time around, uh, I'd highly recommend uh, taking a look at that. That kind of gives you the 20,000 foot view level, so to speak. Uh, and then today we're going to focus on two of the key areas, project management and uh, system lifecycle. Uh, and then in Q3 and Q4, we'll hit on other areas like uh, financial management, general management. Don, I don't want to dominate. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just impressed that you asked me to get off of mute, uh, Jack, because usually you're trying to mute me. Uh, <laughs> just uh, one point is the highly interactive. And so make sure that if you got questions, you just fire them up here. That's what we're here for. We're going to we're going to hit on some topics, but really interested in hearing what uh, what's on your mind so that we can uh, help you through that. And I think Sanders already started to uh, post on the chat. So use the chat, you can use the question Q and A and we can capture it there too. All right, awesome. Okay, so um, we just want to set some expectations um, about this particular web event. Um, we wanted to kind of distinguish that it's not a webinar. Um, so don't expect a lot of, uh, you know, a canned presentation crammed with lots of slides. Uh, the real intent here is to more lead in open uh, discussion, as Don mentioned. Um, so certainly invite questions um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, want to respond to any uh, questions you have about the particular practices or verification that you need. Um, uh, and we have in our, our peer groups that we facilitate, and one of the most popular exercises is called I Wish I Knew. Uh, during which we kind of go around the table, maybe it's a virtual table, but we ask them kind of what's bothering them, what's kind of currently up, um, you know, what are you kind of afraid to ask? Uh, and then, uh, you know, we gather those topics and prioritize what the group wants to discuss. So kind of want to borrow a little bit of that concept is, um, you know, this should be a, a two-way street. Um, and, you know, feel free to bring up, you know, here are some challenges we're having in this area. Just would like uh, clarification from the auditor. Um, so uh, if not, quite frankly, it'll be a pretty short session. All right, so one of the uh, things- Jack, like a, a typical meeting that I'm in, you know, that if you don't ask me questions, I, I've got a list of everybody's on the call, so I'll, I'll single you up <laughs> ask the <your> questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, one of the things we'd like to do to just kind of get a feel of, you know, kind of where people are at in the process, if no, nothing else, by kind of the size of companies that are represented in the audience is um, do a quick poll. So Sandra, could you uh, do that for us now? So yeah, if anybody, uh, you can quickly just pick kind of which bin of your system integration business in particular, if you're part of a larger organization, less interested in that and more what you would define as, as the number of employees or people that work within your system integration business. Yeah, and like you said, uh, Jack, this really helps us tailor our answers to the questions because if it's uh, predominantly all large companies, we're gonna answer it one way and if it's uh, more mid-sized companies, we'll, we'll have a bit of a different answer. So participation in this is great. Awesome. Where are we at with that poll, Sandra? Did we get some input and some results? All right, here we have it, Don. Um, good smattering of everybody. <laughs> so we have some, some folks that are uh, smaller companies, but uh, almost really 25% straight across the board, maybe a slight leaning to, to uh, smaller companies, but uh, good representation throughout. Unfortunately for us, Don, that doesn't help us as far as catering the discussion <laughs> one way or another. So let's let's just keep keep that there are uh, companies of all sizes in this particular audience and, and try to speak to that. All right. So um, this these are the two areas that we're here to kind of um, discuss and answer questions about today. Um, they're kind of at the heart, if you will, of the best practices, the middle chapters uh, around project management and lifecycle management. And 
I guess the first thing is we we uh, often get questions because at first blush, you know, people are like, well, what's the difference between these two chapters? You know, they, they seem similar. They're both addressing aspects of project execution. Kind of why are they in two different chapters? And uh, Don, you know, you can go back through the history perhaps even more than I do. There, there's a time at which this was probably all combined in the sequ- uh, single uh, chapter, but over the course of time, uh, the committee and its wisdom has really uh, kind of broken this into to the two parts. One is, I'll say on the left side, is more kind of how you manage projects, kind of the business aspects of projects. And then on the right side is uh, how you manage more the technical execution of the projects. Um, you know, in smaller SI organizations, I'd say, you know, this is often the same person. Um, you know, they often have the senior technical person is t- uh, also strapped with trying to do the project management activities. But, you know, as uh, system integration organizations get more sophisticated, larger, uh, you know, these two roles and kind of perspectives are, um, you know, drawn out. And often you would actually see somebody assign project management responsibilities uh, and somebody else assign a uh, technical lead. Um, there's actually a third role, which is uh, kind of a bit more of the client uh, facing interests. But, um, you know, for the purpose of these two chapters, uh, consider it from that perspective. The, the business aspects of the project management and then the technical aspects of um, of the life cycle. Yeah, and this is where, you know, asking the question of the size of the companies comes into effect, right? So those that 38% of the people on the call here um, that were in the smaller company size, this would not make a whole lot of sense to split it out because probably it's one person doing, doing everything, right? The 38% that were on the 50 and above type of uh, company size would say, yeah, this, yeah, this is how we do it. We have project managers and we have technical people and it's much clearer in their mind. So as you're, as you're going through an audit, if that's what your intent is to get the best practices in place so you can go through an audit, um, we will separate those out. The business or commercial aspect of, of doing a project and the deliverable or the technical aspect. Okay, um, I, I also highlighted in black just for, uh, you know, or bold, uh, the the areas in which when it comes down to the audit process that there are specific sections or, or, or questions uh, in the audit that have to do with those areas. Uh, not terribly surprising, every single aspect of project management, there is a uh, audit question related to it and, uh, you know, about half of, of the life cycle management, uh, in which again, the committee and its uh, wisdom has said that, you know, these are the most important best practices or all the best practices in the guidebook are, are great suggestions. Um, but in order to pass the audit, certain ones were deemed of higher priority to, uh, uh, to, to audit on. So I guess, um, you know, in, in the spirit of keeping it, um, uh, you know, open to questions and being a two-way street. So uh, what what questions do you have, uh, let's say on the project management side first? Bob's, uh, Bob's got a good question up there. And that is the, to the point that I talked about earlier, mm-hmm. where do we see this breaking out? And, you know, Bob, it's not just strictly speaking tied to the number of uh, employees. It, it's also tied to the the size of the projects, right? So if you have a $50,000 project, you can probably have an engineer that can do the technical side of it and the project management side of it. So you might have a company that's full of $50,000 projects, but as the company grows and as the project size grows, then clearly you'll get to the point where one person can't do it all. One person managing two or three people can't really effectively focus on the commercial and the technical side. So it says, much about the size of the projects uh, that is going to define when that breakout occurs more so than really the number of people. Number of people in the company is usually a reasonable surrogate though for the type and size of projects you're going to get into. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Don. If you're looking for something specific, then I'll, I'll try and come up with them. I was just going to add, Don, that, you know, even even we'll say larger companies, meaning more and more people often still have a mix of smaller projects as well. And we'll see this uh, dichotomy and kind of how they choose to to manage these two sides of the equation. 
um, smaller projects, they'll tend to not be able to cost of justify having separate roles, or maybe the, the PM role is um, uh, something where a, a dedicated PM is spending a portion of time just kind of coordinating with the technical lead that's that's really responsible for the actual project management and of that. Um, so it's more a supplement of effort than, than a dedicated effort. Yeah, and that brings up another good point. You just brought up the term roles, right? So we were just actually finishing a conversation with another client where even on a $50,000 project, there is a project management role and there is a technical role. So uh, probably uh, the best thing to think about is start to refine what those roles actually are. It may be one person filling both those roles, but there are accountabilities that are different between the two of them. So I might be a senior project engineer that has technical responsibilities, but I may be filling the role of project manager. So let's make sure that that defined. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I, you know, I see, and I'm sure you see this as well, Don, uh, there is a tendency, I will say, in our industry that, that you know, uh, as uh, smaller integration companies uh, grow uh, and been around for a while, uh, there can be a tendency to, well, a logical kind of career path or the next thing to, to uh, provide a senior engineer with, you know, responsibilities is, oh, well, of course, we, we then uh, give them project management responsibilities as well. And that, that gets almost baked into its part of the career path. And one of the challenges we see with that is there may be people that actually have a skill set uh, that's much more suited to staying technical. Um, but if the only uh, career path you present to somebody is well you have to take project management uh, to to um, to advance yourself within this organization and it's almost like a trap you could end up having people try to embrace skills that they they don't even want to go after and actually when it comes to this left side of the equation that can be executed not as well just because that that's not of a particular interest to them and and certainly when the project gets hot and heavy. Uh, those that do want to stay technical will tend to drop the project management ball and focus on the technical aspects. So uh, I would say as a system integration company matures, they tend to really recognize that project management is fundamentally different than technical management and um, develop career paths for, for both sides. Yeah, Jack, I'd, I'd like to get to focus a little bit more on, on some of the project management, uh, some of the areas that we see in the project management. And you've heard me, and other people have heard me say, you know, the, the secret to project management is check it off really well and close it out really well. The stuff in between, yeah, we just kind of, we make that happen, right? But it's really critical about the, the way in which you set the project up and the way in which you close it out. And, and to that end, one of the common things that we see is, uh, I'm going to talk around contracts, right? And contract review and things of that nature on the project management side. And, and uh, we ask a question during the audit, uh, is the work you've done contractually authorized? And it's vague enough because what we want to do is hear what the integrator considers contractually authorized. And a lot of times we will get, especially on the first audit, we'll get people saying, oh yes, we have to have a PO, we have to have the customer signature on this document and that document. And I typically let them go on and on about that and then just call BS on it. Because the reality of it is in our industry, we have key accounts that are gonna phone us up and they've had the proposal for how long and now they just need to get the work done and they're purchasing cycle is going to stretch that out a little bit. So they say, hey, can you get started today, right? It's a key account. You're not gonna tell them to you know, consult until uh, I get the PO, you're gonna probably take it on. So you're far better off to just recognize that fact and say, okay, how do we do that? What is the process for doing that? What are the limitations? Maybe we can't buy any material until we actually have the PO, or maybe we can only have, you know, we can only spend 80 hours of engineering or something like that. But, but, but um, yeah, when you're writing up the procedures around the contract side of it, keep in mind that our business is unique enough in that 
uh, we can't oftentimes just sit and wait. We have to actually jump in. And so what are the processes for doing that? Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, Don, it's, you know, uh, the contractual authorization doesn't necessarily just be, is a black and white go, no go, but actually develop a procedure that matches kind of how you actually operate as a business, which is, okay, under these certain defined criterion, we will start work even without a PO in hand, but these criterions have to be met to key account. There's um, a well-defined scope or, you know, whatever those criterions are for yourself that would say, okay, at least internally, we authorize this work, whether or not we have the PO in hand from the customer or not. But that, that is then, you know, a document, a discipline that can be followed uh, if the criterion's met. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you bring up a really good point. When you're, when you're documenting your procedures, and so the 38% of the companies that are just starting to do that, keep this in mind. When you're documenting your procedure, don't, don't write what you wish you did. <laughs> write what you do and over time, figure out whether or not you want to improve on that. Yeah, absolutely. And we cover off some of that in the, the Q1, kind of just getting yourself oriented to, exactly. to really doing best practice as well. So, um, you know, the other thing I think about, Don, on the contracting side is actually the other, uh, other end of it, which is not the contracting with the client, but to the extent that you're subcontracting and the other work, um, that there's, uh, uh, you know, that needs to be paid as attention, uh, you know, in some sense, just as important to pay attention to that as the client side contract. So. You know, for instance, you know, uh, what what you know, what sort of uh, vetting, what sort of uh, things are you putting in place to make sure that you are picking someone that uh, uh, is well suited to do the subcontracting work? They have the skills, they have the abilities to do it. And then, from a contractual perspective, you know, how how tight is that relationship? What do the T's and C's, for instance, flow through so that whatever your warranting to the client and your T's and C's are also uh, appropriately mirrored um, in what you're uh, authorizing a subcontractor to do as part of that project. Yeah, and I think this is even more important today than it was in 2018, 2019, and that there's a lot more that you need to flow through. So for instance, your clients might have certain uh, COVID-related uh, constraints or safety related constraints that didn't even exist before. And you need to make sure that when you're, when you're having a contract with a subcontractor, that they understand that whatever you're bound by with your contract with the customer, they are also going to be bound by uh, just, it's called a flow through. So yeah, that's a good point, Jack. Just making sure that they are aware of, uh, it's not just, you know, you get paid in 30 days or anything like that. There's a whole lot more to it. Yeah, and I think the you know reality is you know we saw the latest easy stats come out from CSIA that uh, every, everybody's really seeing their work pick up, and um, so in addition to trying to uh, literally hire more people, I think it obviates that there is likely to be more subcontracting work going on as as uh, you know demand exceeds the capacity of our system integration community. So uh, even more so, um, uh, either either for companies that haven't even done any subcontracting, but now suddenly recognize that they're gonna to have to do that to meet demand, much less, you know, people that do subcontracting that are looking to substantially expand that to meet capacity. Um, I, I do think this area um, will become even more important than the, as you said, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, the flex workforce type of concept. Um, and and we, we do see a lot of certified integrators looking to other certified integrators to help flex that work. Yeah, absolutely. All right, want to keep an eye to if people have any questions in these areas as we begin to discuss them, um, you know, feel free to post them. We're happy to to answer point questions as we're kind of, you know, prattling through this. Yeah, All right, we what seem to have a pretty shy group. I don't know that it doesn't make sense. But <laughs> You see what anybody you in the that? audience that based on the recent audit of them, you want to call them out about? <laughs> well, I wouldn't do that. But, 
All right. Um, what else on the, the left side here, Don, on the project management? Um, you know, I'm sure we could spend time on any number of these and, and don't in that short hour of time. Um, you know, my mind, uh, you know, kind of shifts down uh, to, to the change management area. Um, one of my, my favorite things to talk about uh, from a best practices implementation area, starting with, uh, you know, what constitutes change. Yeah, uh, it's, it's scope management, and we're interested. Mm -hmm. We were just in a meeting earlier about change orders and how uh, you know some some companies perceive change orders as being a um, uh, I don't know kind of a nasty word or a bad thing or anything like that. In the meantime, you see a lot of people starting to move their methodologies uh, to agile, which is it's all about change, right? And you, and the scope. The scope is not rock solid, so so I think our industry is going to start to develop a little bit more maturity around it. But uh, to a large extent, the scope management and change scope, uh, change order management is something that is really makes or breaks most systems integrators. It it hits on multiple different areas within the uh, integrator, like whether it's sales or finance or uh, resource management or engineering or whatever, there's a lot of even clients. So it's a fairly complex process. Um, and I guess the companies that I see that come out of see the electrical contracting or something like that, they really get this and they do a pretty good job. Generally speaking, um, if you're just coming from more of, in, you know, I'm the engineer and I, I just want to do it right the first time, they tend to do a little bit weaker job on this one. Yeah. You know, what I always encourage uh, our clients to think about in this area is kind of the, the, the level of change, because it, it, it's another one of those areas where if you just kind of define it as black and white, it can, it can become problematic really easy, which is, well, we only define change as change is when we're going to charge the customer. Um, you know, that, that's a pretty high bar to set on that, I would encourage people to think about changes, you know, anytime when it's going to say affect the kind of core, core elements of, you know, scope, budget, schedule, uh, certainly if it changes the, uh, fundamentally changes the requirements uh, or specification, um, you know, that's a change. That has nothing to do uh, and should be documented in change management. Uh, it has, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether the client is going to be charged about it, but fundamentally if you're making a change that um, changes what is actually being delivered to the client in any substantive way, then uh, you know that needs to be documented so that we actually deliver the solution that is consistent with what you've told the client that you're going to do. Uh, and then important, but you know, secondarily is then are we going to charge for this? Um, and from a best practices perspective, I would always recommend that you um, you document what that change is going to cost, um, regardless of whether or not you're going to charge the client for that. Uh, I say that for two reasons. Uh, uh, one is it, it reinforces with your engineering team that changes cost the project. And the more consistently you note that and recognize and estimate the value of that change, then the more you have an appreciation from your engineering team on on the impact of saying yes to these changes. And then secondly, even if you're not going to be charging the client, you establish some record uh, of history with the client that, look, we've made these number of changes for you. It's cost the project this much. Um, we can't, we just can't continue in this path um, without having the discussion about how we can uh, get adequate compensation for these changes. Yeah, and Ken, I did see your question, so I'll, I'll get to that in just a sec, but I want to just pick up a bit on what uh, Jack was saying, too. Um, so a really good practice is actually a conversation during the kickoff meeting with the customer around how change management is going to be handled, right? So walk them through your change order procedure. Make sure you got confirmation on that change order procedure um, with the customer at that point in time. Secondarily, or another aspect is that this whole change order procedure is highly dependent on your methodology. So if you have a V model methodology, which requires a lot of validation all the way through, then your change in scope uh, during the implementation could require changes on several of the documents that were developed earlier on in the project, just so that 
the validation is going to work at the, at the back end. So, and like I said, if I'm doing agile, it kind of would be handled a whole bunch, a whole bunch differently than it would with a waterfall. So Ken was asking a question about, um, we touched a little bit on the different types of roles, the technical leader, the project manager, the client manager type of thing. And, and is that strictly based on size of the project or dollar volume of the project or do other things um, factor into it? And, and that's a, it's a great question, Ken, because it kind of gets back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of the kickoff. So during your project kickoff, you're going to define what methodology am I going to use? You know, what's, what's my project management plan that I'm, I'm going to use? Is this a project that has enough risk on it that I need to separate it out so the technical leader is 100% focused on the technology um, and the project manager is 100% focused on the business success of it. And so I'm probably going to want two different resources. So um, that decision is not one that you do, okay, here's my practice and it's done. It's done really on a project by project base, basis and it can be influenced by skill level of the individuals that are on the project, uh, the complexity of the project, the risk of the project, uh, you know, a, a number of different factors. But during the setup of the project and the project management plan, that's where you kind of make that determination. And it could, as I said, in many cases, be one person for an OK rule. Project risk and risk ranking. Another great question from Ken. So, so one of the things uh, about risk in the, in the audit and the best practices, we hit on risk in a number of different places. Everything from strategic planning and what risks are the company facing that way and um, pre-qualification on a sales call or um, during, let's say the pre-qual says, yeah, we're gonna go ahead with it. Then as we're doing the estimating and proposal writing, what kind of risks do we analyze as we present the proposal to the customer? What kind of risks do we talk to the customer about? And then um, how much of that flows actually through into the project management? The earlier phases, uh, all through sales, pre-qualification, estimating and all of that, that's typically a risk assessment. And there's a big difference between risk assessment and risk management. So when you get into the project management side, which is what we're dealing with here, we're expecting that you're gonna talk about what are the risks, what's the probability, and what's the impact, and then have some contingencies in place on how you're planning on, on dealing with that. And then on a regular basis, whether that's monthly or bi-weekly or whatever, reassessing all those risks to see if they change. So that's the management aspect of it. Yeah, I uh, agree with all you of that, can, Don. You ask about ranking, you can yeah. ask it. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, um, yeah, I was trying to get to the, the kind of ranking aspect and is it multi-tiered. Um, yeah, I think the simple answer to that is, um, you know, I would say a best practice area is, uh, will be multi-tiered, they just, um, they're, the level of risk just by the sheer size of the project probably dictates how much um, time you want to invest in doing that risk assessment. So if it's a smaller project that's deemed, um, you know, less risk to, or uh, yeah, you know, less risk to the company, then it usually gets less, uh, less assessment around it, so. Yeah, and what I, often see Ken is a big long laundry list of risks and then a lot of does not apply does not apply does not apply right so you you, you just refresh everybody's minds and thinking about oh yeah I never thought about that risk and there's a collective bargaining agreement uh, negotiation going on with the client oh yeah I not thought about that or uh, financial security of the client or anything like that right so there's I, I would recommend that you have a kind of a laundry list that you can go through real quickly and just just uh, identify those specific ones that are going to hit on. Yeah, the, yeah, no, this I, particular I project. absolutely agree with that, Don. Is that uh, you know the uh, um, the risk 
is to only look at technical risk, right? That, that, that would be a, a less sophisticated risk assessment, right? And having a laundry list that makes it compels you to look at whether the other potential risks uh, to the project, whether other vendors are involved or service providers are involved in the solution, uh, client side uh, risk um, and their ability to uh, support the project, um, to finance the project, business factors that they, you may be able to assess that might uh, impact the likelihood that the project goes forward. You know, just having those in your laundry list to just make sure that you uh, put eyes on different factors and make sure that you are considering all the risks um, uh, you know, is, is wise to do. Yeah, and one of the other areas that we get questioned a lot about is how much of the risk do we share with the customer? Well, there's going to be some risk that you identify that you want to keep internally, but I, I look at it from this perspective. If I went to a surgeon and the surgeon said, uh, yeah, I'm going to do an operation on you. Don't worry about it. I got this. I'd probably want a second opinion, right? So our clients are looking to us as being experts at automation. And so they're expecting us to understand the risks and hopefully make them aware of any risks that occur. So there are a number of integrators that feel that that, that makes the customer un, feel uncomfortable with them or that maybe they don't have this handled. But I think that, that you're better off to have an open and honest conversation about the risks with the client. All right. Hey. Don, you know, I want to get over to the uh, the technical management side, but you know, before we leave there, um, you know, you and I talked in advance about um, uh, kind of quality, which has become uh, you know a hot topic in our uh, operational excellence group. Um, so, uh, do you want to talk about quality in particular with respect to project management, and then perhaps beyond that? Yeah, sure. I, I'm I'm glad we didn't skip that one over because much like I talked about the project management plan and how that document is critical. It's a document that says, okay, here's all my standard practices and these are the these are the 13% or 50% that I'm going to apply on this project. Quality and quality management planning is very, very similar to that. We have a whole bunch of standards that we typically follow. I'm going to write that down on a document. I'm going to have that available. But oh, on this project, you know, the uh, HMI screens, we're not going to use our standards. We're going to use the customer standards. Um, things of that nature, right? It, it, it's a project, a good project quality plan is not a 40 page document. It's probably one or two pages of here are the standards that we're gonna follow and including a quality assurance. And here's how we're gonna make sure that those particular um, standards are, are actually followed. One of the things that we're seeing right now on the quality side is a little bit more of a move away from just the uh, you know the report card type thing, and focusing more on operational excellence. So how do we how do we take a quality system and have that um, focused on improving overall overall operational um, efficiencies and effectiveness? Yeah, and I just add that um, this is another great conversation to have with the client. Um, you know, at the at kickoff or even beforehand, which is um, you know what what quality standards, measures, or whatnot should we use to, to judge the uh, uh, quality of the solution that's being delivered to you, you know, beyond just, okay, check, check boxes and met the functional specification, you know, you know how, how, how are we going to judge how the, the quality, the goodness of, of the solution? Um, and it can just provoke a conversation that, A, uh, helps you discover that um, yes, there are certain quality measures that the client are looking for that um, you would want to have as part of that discovery. Or two, it gives you an opportunity to lean into, uh, hey, Mr. Client, just so you know, these are the quality standards we hold ourselves to. And in some sense, you know, is a little bit of that plus advertising, which uh, distinguishes, can distinguish you to say, look, we, we, we're not just another uh, fly by night system integrator, we, we're one that holds ourselves to certain rigors and, hey, Mr. Client, we, we wanted you to know that, that this, we will be holding ourselves to these standards. Hey, Mr. Customer, I'm sure my other competitors on this have uh, talked to you about their project quality plan, but I, I just want to talk to you about how mine's a little bit different. Great, uh -huh. because good chance the other guys didn't talk about it. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, all right. Um, last but not least, Don, um, we can't we can't step out of the the left side of project management without talking about closure because, as you well know, there there's always a temptation to got the project done. Let's just move on to the next one. Yeah, that I mean, project closeout hurting cats. You know, everybody just really eager to move on to something else. We've had enough of this. We've been grinding away on it for way too long. Uh, however, there are a lot of things in project closeout that are, are pretty critical, like getting final acceptance from the customer, understanding when warranty actually started, um, getting final payment. Uh, it's it's my favorite procedure to have a flow chart with swim lanes because it just involves so many different parts of the company. We've seen uh, integrators do things like the lessons learned. We're, ha we're seeing integrators use some um, sort of YouTube type technology for that, right? So they'll have the project manager or the lead engineer do a short little uh, YouTube video. And then they just use that as ongoing training for, for uh, future jobs and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty critical uh, process, a complex process that involves a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, and we, we talk a lot about checklists, but certainly another area where having a, uh, a good exhaustive checklist to make sure that you um, are extracting the maximum value out of the project as possible. I mean, when you think about it, you spent all this time and effort to deliver a good solution to, to your clients, and it's uh, perhaps the best time to really make sure during the closeout that you've captured that value. That may be, uh, you know, uh, from a reuse aspect, you know, what, what, what are the kind of uh, is the IT and assets that have been developed and how are we going to use that? The lessons learned, obviously, is, you know, uh, here's some challenges we ran in along the way. And as one of my, our clients uh, said recently in a peer group, that he, lessons learned, unless a procedure has changed to uh, based on the lesson learned, it wasn't really a lesson learned. Um, uh, so anyways, all the way through kind of the business aspects of close out, which is a great time to follow up with the client, uh, find out how they, what they felt about the project leading to the next one or a reference to another project, uh, uh, et cetera. There's just lots of opportunity to, um, really get the value out of that project. That's just simply missed. If you just want to turn the page and move on to the next project. Yeah. I just want to throw in two more points on, on that one that are are uh, pretty critical, um, and that is uh, passing the liability of software licenses and cybersecurity back over to the client. So I bought a whole bunch of software licenses. I know I registered. I know I gave the client's name and everything like that it, when I registered it, making the client aware that they now have responsibility for a software license, for multiple software licenses. And the second thing, in, in particularly today with the colonial pipelines and stuff like that going on, making sure that the customer understands the level of cybersecurity protection that you've built into the system, which probably is none, um, unless you specifically spell that out as, um, as a, an offering of the project. You don't want them making an assumption that all our level level zero, level one devices are, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're protected from cybersecurity, if they're not. All right. Well, it occurs to me, Don, we should have much longer sessions to really cover all this stuff but uh yeah just try and, you try and I talk too much no just you know the, these topic areas are so rich so uh i uh, do want to make sure we're spending time on the, the technical side of it as well and it, it's a good time uh, sandra i know we asked you to prepare another poll for us which is um as don kind of alluded to before um some of the technical management certainly has to do with how the I'll say the project methodology of the technical management, meaning, you know, um, is it waterfall, is it B-model, is it agile, is it more of a service and support uh, engagement? Um, so we just like to get a sense of what project methodology these do you use. Sandra, if you could put that pull up. Awesome. And this is one that you can check all that apply to your organization. Um, so we're just trying to see currently within our uh, automation industry and with in this particular group, whether the type of projects you're seeing and how you're choosing to, to um, manage the technical implementation. And well, that's getting filled Hopefully up. Hopefully those, really those models are pretty self-evident. I'm really surprised Dave hasn't asked a question yet. Because he almost always does. Okay. All 
All right. Yeah. Hopefully those are understood. I guess if you don't understand what one of those methodologies are, then you're probably not doing it. So. Uh, <laughs> All right, Sandra, do we give it enough time? Are there people still entering information or can we see what the results are? We still have a few people entering in results. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and just for clarity, uh, Agile isn't one where we don't really have a methodology. So we'll just kind of <laughs> yeah, no, Agile is definitely a methodology. There are people very passionate about doing that. All right, here we have it. Um, so, once again, a fairly good balance here, Don. We see, um, you know, the traditional waterfall methodology still uh, being widely used. Uh, Vimo, and I think it's interesting that see Agile is now um, caught up, at least with respect to this audience. Um, just as many people are employing Agile methodology as, as uh, Waterfall actually more than B-Model. And uh, I guess we shouldn't be surprised, you know, service and support engagements are a, uh, a necessary um, part of being in the system integration business, so that, that's going to track high. Yeah, we're seeing it here for sure. And yeah, that is nice to see that, that are interesting, at least to see that Agile going up uh, um, and particularly as we move up through the pyramid, moving more uh, state MES type of thing, then yeah, customers don't know what they want. Yeah, yeah, and I guess given that backdrop, Don, um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the kickoffs, but you know, when it comes to these methodologies, I think about as far as uh, that kind of requirements and design phase, um, mm -hmm. uh, even bleeding into development, you know. How is this uh, project being managed? How are you, uh, what sort of requirements do you have going into the project? And then how do you design uh, to meet those requirements and how do you uh, then manage the development process? Do you want yeah, to break that into so parts or? Uh, let's see what I could do across the wall, right? So, you know, internal and external kickoff standard agenda to uh, deal with those, um, you know, with your external kickoff, that's when you talk to the client about, okay, who am I going to give this software license to? Who's ultimately on your side going to take care of cyber security? Um, who's the project? Who has authority to buy or, you know, buy, buy the client? You know, all of that sort of stuff all gets covered off during the external kickoff. Internal, what the heck are we building, right? So having conversations with the team to make sure that, you know, whether that's a sales handoff or a part of the internal kickoff or whatever, making sure that the, the technical team clearly understands what it is that they're building. Uh, on, on the requirements, for, one thing we see in some places is, and it's tied a little bit to the project methodology, is the a stage gate methodology where um, you actually stop work until the customer approves the next step. We see that in most cases around things like electrical drums, where yeah, we will we, release the electrical drums for approval um, and wait until it gets back if we actually start building it. But in some cases, some manageability, particularly in countries where the cost of labor is pretty cheap and can actually afford that, um, they will stop the project and wait until our customer signs off. In a lot of cases, particularly in North America, Europe, we're seeing, yeah, we can't even get the customers to sign off on the document, so we just keep moving. But still, in um, in the methodology that I'm using, I, I want to know where it is that are there several steps during the project where the customer needs to say, yep, yeah, that's exactly what I expected, keep moving. Um, so whether that's preliminary design review or final design review or whatever. And then on this side, the life cycle management side of it, it's as much about the internal, right? So we have, do we have internal architecture reviews or internal preliminary design reviews? Who would do that? Is it, you know, it, it's usually very dependent on, on the particular project. So if I've got a project that is staffed with a lot of junior people, maybe I want to have more design reviews uh, than that. So, um, you know, it's an important step of trying to figure out whether or not we're on track to build something to our company brand or that individual's brand. 
Right. Well, Don, seeing as we have a somewhat bashful audience, I'll, I'll ask the question. So when it comes to an auditing perspective, given that you see you know, these uh, system integrators embracing these different project methodologies, how does that go from an audit perspective? Um, you know, do they answer it? Well, if it's a you know waterfall project, we do it this way. If there's an agile project, we do it that way. You know, how do you navigate the waters as an auditor when you you know the, I'll say that the answers uh, are going to be dictated by the methodology of that particular project. It's a it's a really good question, and it's. Uh, it's an interesting question. It was actually out of in one company that was in pharmaceutical and automotive. You, you can't get two more different kind of industries, right? So the automotive, just get it done type thing. And the pharmaceutical is, no, you're going to do a view model. We're going to track it. And um, they had an audit done by one of the customers, the pharmaceutical side of it. And, and the uh, audit required that the, all documentation reflected the methodology. So it was even different color paper type of thing, right? So it's it's a couple of things. How am I going to decide what methodology I'm going to use? But even more importantly, how do I communicate? It looks like Don, you may have cut out there for a second, but if I understand where you were headed with that, is not only how do you decide what methodology that you're going to choose, but then how do you communicate to the team and to the client that this is the methodology we're going to be, uh, be using that can impact things like the change order process and whatnot, depending on the type of methodology. And I suppose from an auditing perspective, uh, a lot of this comes down to uh, documenting what you do and then being able to show you do what you say. So. Um, that that ability, you know, the answer from an audit perspective may in fact be, well, it depends on the project. And as long as you can demonstrate, okay, that project we do it, um, it was determined that we were going to do it this way. And this is kind of how we decide that. And then we follow this process and that's defined and we can demonstrate that we're following that process. Did we get Don back or am I El Lobo solo at this point? Looks like it's just you, Jack. I hope you have <laughs> Don is signing back on now. He's signing back That's on. That's all right. Now. I have conversations <laughs> with myself all the time, so not not a problem. Um, I, I'd say you know, next thing I'd skip down to, and it's kind of highlighted there, is uh, the acceptance testing. Um, you know, certainly see a variety of different practices that um, uh, clients use in this uh, certain respect, but um, uh, to the extent it is a well find requirements um, because it, it's more of a waterfall or V model. Um, actually, C is kind of a better practice is that acceptance testing is getting defined essentially at the same time that the, that specification is finalized. Um, so uh, it's a great time actually to go, okay, here's the specification. We bo both sides have signed off on that. Then, okay, let's go through it spec by spec and say, how are we going to validate this during accept the acceptance process to say that we've met this specification? So it almost is just like a flow through in those particular places. And I'd even say in more of an agile, where maybe the requirements aren't as form formally defined as far as uh, it's a little bit dependent on what things get prioritized is what the ultimate uh, um, you know, what is ultimately delivered, there's still the same practice that as things get prioritized, okay, this is prioritized, it's now within spec, um, what are we going to do at acceptance time to validate that? Yeah, Ken, so it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, third world uh, internet, it was third world power grid, so we just lost all power, so I'm dialing in on my cell phone now, so yeah, yeah. Well, you missed some good stuff, Don, because I was speaking instead of you. But uh, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we were kind of into acceptance testing. Now, I know this is, you know, this probably has never come up with you and then your clients, uh, Don, but they say, you know, we just can't do factory acceptance tests because, you know, we don't have the clients, you know, set up. We don't have their manufacturing line. So how can we reasonably do a factory acceptance test? Does that ever happen? Get that yeah, feedback? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to get that. Um, and so 
as Jack said, and we kind of alluded to on the screen here, we skip through things like unit and module level and integration testing. That That's not even part of the audit, right? But there is, so really what we're trying to figure out here is, are you one of those integrators that gets your software about 80% of the way done and then you go to the customer site and you try and finish it up there? Or are you one of the integrators that gets the gets it completed as, as complete as possible? and then go to the uh, customer site and, and you do the testing to confirm that, right? So, so if you think of it from the perspective of, well, uh, are you telling me you can't even do unit tests or module level tests, then you probably haven't um, built enough robustness into the project, right? So simulate, simulate things, uh, there's a lot of good simulators out there and emulators out there, so. Um, yeah. It, the bigger question typically comes up is witnessed or unwitnessed on factory test, right? How many of your customers are willing to come in and do a witness factory acceptance test uh, versus, no, nah, no, nah, just go ahead. No matter what, I, I really think being able to hold the project team accountable to actually having a test before you get on the customer site is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really goes to efficiency, and ultimately that translates to profitability, which is, you know, the more that you can eliminate those variables through fact a factory acceptance test, um, the less you have to deal with on site. So, coming up with that kind of robustness that you suggest on this mechanism to uh, kind of hold your own feet to the fire. What what can we do to shake out as much? Um, risk of showing up on the site and having something not work as expected um, is will ultimately save you time and money. Yeah, I, um, one of the things on factor acceptance test, and I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here, but one of the things is think about how you're gonna handle punch list. So um, an area that the factory acceptance test allows you is to find whether or not there is a recurring root cause to problems, right? And so figure out how you're going to handle your punch list and whether or not that is going to be a system that allows you to go back in time and say, you know what, we always miss this fuse or, you know what, we always miss some aspect of it. And so you can start to improve on your processes. Yeah. All right. Um, as uh, Don said, we're kind of coming up on the top of the hour. So I um, want to, uh, take a breath, see if there's any other uh, questions um, that you would like to hit on uh, either something that we've discussed today or something that you were hoping we'd discuss. <clears throat> well, we must have just answered all the questions. Oh, oh, yeah, I was going to say, I don't have access to the Q&A on my screen because it's a little bit small right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, there were there were a few posted, but we kind of got to them as designed uh, during the session instead of trying to stack them up at the end. Um, if we don't have any of those, we also are always interested in any ideas, any takeaways that you had from the session today, um, things that particularly resonated for you, or you jotted down to say, hey, yep, that's something, um, you know, a, a new insight that uh, we need to take a look at always interested in that feedback as well. Yeah, if you can put that in the chat or the uh, Q&A or whatever, just, you know, your takeaways, your key takeaways, that would be super. Uh, Sandra, I'll let you take that one about will the, this recording be available, seeing this is a CSI web event. Yes, the recording will be available uh, in the next couple of days. Awesome. Did you see this one here from Bob about, uh, Don, do you agree that the site acceptance test should duplicate the factory acceptance test, but with live sig field signals? Uh, it's, it's usually very, very similar, but there's probably some things that you can test that you, because you're on site. So you start to, um, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit more. Let me roll that back a, li a little bit further in the project. It's your whole acceptance test plan, right? When does the acceptance test plan get um, developed? Maybe in a lot of cases, it's the functional spec just changed with the column added for, for testing purposes. Um, and so then that just flows all the way through to, to the uh, site acceptance test. Yeah. 
but yeah, usually it's very similar. Yeah, and I actually seen it carried out that way, which was there's a couple of columns for the factory acceptance test, and then there's a couple more co uh, columns for the side of the acceptance test. And uh, I've even seen rigor that, okay, if the factory's uh, acceptance test can't be done for some reason, that reason is noted there, uh, and it flows through to, okay, th then this must be uh, covered off in the side acceptance test. All right. Uh, well, we do want to thank everybody for their uh, time today and, uh, you know, uh, mention to you that this this is what we do. Uh, this is what Exotech is about, is helping you build a successful system immigration company. So, um, you know, if you feel like you need assistance in that area, um, you know, please uh, reach out to us and we'll uh, figure out what the best way to support you is. Sometimes that's helping you with the uh, preparations for the audit process. That could be, hey, what you, we really should do is get you uh, in a peer group with other like-minded individuals um, to focus on this area or aspect of your business and have them make it a strategic advantage. Um, you know, just just reach out and we'll, we'll uh, uh, figure out the best way that we can help you. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. And now I'll go and try and find out why my standby generator didn't start. <laughs> All right, everyone. All have right. a good day. On behalf of CSIA, I would like to thank Jack Barber and Don Roberts for this informative discussion. And of course, thank you for attending. I'd also like to remind you that a recording will be available for viewing within the next couple of days. Please visit the CSIA website to view past virtual events you may have missed. Finally, be sure to bookmark the CSIA event calendars so you don't miss any upcoming events. Uh, also, if you have any questions, you can contact Jose Rivera or Lisa Richter uh, to answer your CSIA questions. This concludes our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a great day.